I'd like to tell you a bit about this cross that I made for all of you. And while I show you a bit about the process, if we can start the video, um, of making it over the last nine months. So Julie came to me several years ago and said, Matt, we need, need a new cross. I want you to make it. I said, Julie, you're crazy. It's going to take a lot of time. I don't have time. So she kept coming. Anyone who knows Julie knows she's very persistent. Um, and about two years later, she said, I wanted to have lots of different kinds of wood. I said, yeah, yeah, I know, I know. I don't have time for that. And then that uh, piece of it stuck in my mind, and I started seeing this. I started seeing pieces of this. And I started thinking, well, where could I get the wood? Um, so she told me she had a little bit of budget, so it wasn't going to be all out of pocket money for me. Um, and so we started making a plan. This metaphor captured my imagination. She wanted a lot of different kinds of wood because there are a lot of different kinds of you. Uh, the people that make up Fuller community, the, the worshiping community here in Pasadena, other places in the world, we, we all come from different backgrounds, different places. And I, I love this metaphor. I also took inspiration uh, via Michael Wright. He tipped me off to an artist named Kate uh, Patterson. She did an installation with, it looked a lot like this vase actually, with 10,000 different kinds of, of wood, all built into a room that you could go into. Um, and I started thinking about wood as, um, as a metaphor for people, wood as a metaphor for past, and I started going down this road. So wood can serve as a link to the past. There are shimmering tan catalpa wood pieces from my father-in-law's grandparents' uh, home uh, in this cross. There's red oak from a tree that I used to climb in the pastures of my childhood. There's Hawaiian koa from Nate Merritt, who contributed this to the, to the effort. Um, and there's tro dark tropical mangium wood from Doug McConnell's uh, old waterbed that he brought back uh, from his time in Papua New Guinea. Um, <laughs> If you can find the waterbed wood, there's bonus points. <laughs> there's a uh, cherry, white oak, and old growth pine from sawmills that my grandparents owned in Bearden, Arkansas. Bearden is also the hometown of black liberation theologian James Cone, who we just lost, who also wrote about the dark side of that mill town in the introduction to God of the Oppressed. You should go read that. Wood can also be a symbol of place. Uh, Angel City Lumber here in Los Angeles, um, they mill up wood that has fallen or has to be cut down. There's California live oak here, which you cannot legally cut down, but when it falls, they'll mill it up for you. Um, it's so twisty and wild, and grows really slowly. There's spalted sycamore with a glittering lattice of rays overlaid with cells of fungal colonies, walling themselves off from each other as they try to consume the last nutrients of the dying bones of, of trees. I think there's a metaphor here for churches, if you look closely. This cross is literally held down and held upright by heavy Douglas fir timbers salvaged from a house just down the street from where J.R. Thomas, our neighbor, was killed by the Pasadena Police Department. An event which brought the Black Lives Matter movement into sharp focus for so many of us who had been asleep and gave rise to numerous protests on and off campus and eventually inspired something called a subversive liturgy. If you don't know about that, you should ask Julie or Mitchell after chapel. It ought to be in the curriculum. There are literally pieces of wood salvaged from this Pasadena campus woven into this cross. But don't stop there. In fact, I've left room, and I'd like to invite those of you joining us online and from other parts of the world to consider sharing a small piece of wood that comes from a tree or a place or a part of your history that has significance to you or your intersection with the church or with Fuller. Send them to us, uh, and we'll find a way to fit them into this composition. I hope you'll look at this cross, and I hope you will touch it. I designed the composition to work as a focal point of worship, as a kind of background piece of liturgical furniture um, that can blend into this room, but also as a large form sculpture, depending on how you want to engage with it. I hope it rewards your attention like the details of a stained glass window. It shares the proportions with uh, the earliest crosses we have record of from the third century, one to 1.6 proportion. Uh, but like Fuller, this cross has roots in tradition, but doesn't feel restrained from creativity within it. I like this cross because it mirrors the community of people who gather here from many places, cultures, and denominations and backgrounds. It's not a meditation on guilt or shame or an inward looking exercise in navel gazing, but a reminder that we all come from somewhere. We all have our own particular grain, pattern, hue, shimmer, and strength and that the composition we make together is more beautiful, more interesting, 
than any monoculture. That the tree of this tradition is stronger than it could ever become through the pursuit of the false god of purity. So when you come to chapel or class or a staff meeting and you hear something surprising, maybe something painful, maybe something even a little bit queer, when you hear some new perspective or experience you've never heard before, the most natural thing is to want to retreat into communities of people who look and sound and think like you. But if you listen, you might hear someone whispering deep inside, there's an opportunity to grow here, to grow into something much greater, more interconnected, more interesting, and more holy than any one of us could aspire to alone. Thank you.